السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with special embryology lectures and the development of the head and neck I'm gonna discuss the development of the face, the palate, and the nasal cavity I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and head of anatomy department at Mansour University, Egypt In this presentation, I'm gonna cover the development of both the face, the palate, and the nasal cavity and finally, I'm going to talk about their anomalies. To start first with the development of the face, we should revise important information. This is a side view of an embryo. This bulge represents the forebrain. And this is the mesenchymal condensation in front of the forebrain. This is the first pharyngeal arch. Its dorsal aspect is known as the maxillary process and its ventral aspect here is called the mandibular process. Dorsal to the maxillary process, there is a pulse. This pulse overlies the trigeminal ganglia. Then we have here the second pharyngeal arch. Here will be the first pharyngeal cleft, and this is the cardiac pulse where the heart is gonna develop. We also need to know that the developing neural tube and the surrounding neural crest cells play an important role in developing of many structures in the head and neck. So these cranial neural crystals will migrate from their original location around the, the developing brain and they invade the developing structures at the head and neck leading to the triggering of formation of many structures there like the skeleton of the cranium, the skeleton of the face, the muscles, the vessels and nerves there. So if we rotate the embryo and look at its ventral aspect, we're gonna notice five elevations at the region of the future face. The frontonasal prominence, which is a condensation of the mesenchyme overlying the forebrain. Two maxillary prominences, which represent the dorsal aspect of the first pharyngeal arch. Two mandibular prominences, which represent the ventral aspect of the first pharyngeal arch. So these are the five elevations that will form the face. Between these five elevations, there is a depression called the stomodium that will form the future mouth. At first, the stomodium lies opposite to the primitive pharynx, but is separated from it by a membrane called pacopharyngeal membrane. When this membrane ruptures or breaks down, the stomodium now communicates with the foregut. At the lower part of the frontonasal prominence, just above the stomodium, two thickening of the ectoderm appear by the end of the fourth week of development. These thickenings are called the nasal placodes. Two depressions appear at the nasal placodes. They are called the nasal pits. And on each side of the nasal pit, there are two swellings, one on the medial side we call it the median nasal swelling and one on its lateral side it's called the lateral nasal swelling. And these are proliferation of the mesenchyme at the margins of the nasal pits. In the same time, the right and left mandibular prominences grow towards each other and fuse in the midline and eventually they will form the bones of the lower jaw and also the lower lip. Remember that we have two maxillary swellings at the dorsal aspect of the first pharyngeal arch, two median nasal swellings on the median margins of the nasal pits, and two lateral nasal swellings at the lateral margins of the nasal pits. When the maxillary swellings increase in size, they grow in a medial direction. Thus, they will compress the medial nasal swellings towards each other in the midline, till they finally fuse together. Eventually, the medial nasal swelling will form the feltrum of the upper lip. The lateral nasal swellings will form the ala of the nose and the maxillary swellings will form the lateral part of the upper lip and the cheek.
For the eyes, in the beginning we have to thickening of the uh, ectoderm, it's called lens placodes. They appear on each side of the frontal nasal prominence. They grow in a medial direction with the growth of the maxillary uh, prominences. And finally, they will acquire their final position. Also, we have two grooves that lie between the lateral nasal swelling and the maxillary swelling. They extend obliquely from the angle of the eye downward. They are called the nasolacrimal groove. Uh, this groove will be filled with ectodermal cells to form a cord that will eventually become canalized and transform into a canal or duct called nasolacrimal canal. Its upper part will form the nasolacrimal sac while its lower part will open into the nasal cavity. For the ears, they develop at first as two depressions in the first pharyngeal cleft between the first and second pharyngeal arches. It is better to look at them from the side view. Here we can see uh, the nasal openings here, the developing eye, the first pharyngeal arch, this is the maxillary prominence and this is the mandibular prominence and this is the second pharyngeal arch and this is the first pharyngeal cleft and six hillux or six elevations, three from the first pharyngeal arch and three from the second pharyngeal arch will form the auricle of the ear. Notice the location of the ear. It lies below the first pharyngeal arch. But then they grow in a posterior and upward direction. And finally, they will acquire the final shape of the auricle. For example, uh, elevation number one will give us the trigus, and this elevation opposite to it, number six, will give us the anti trigus. And the remaining elevations here will give us the rest of the oracle. For the development of the palate, the medial nasal prominences fuse in the midline to form the philtrum of the upper lip. And they also fuse in a deep direction to form what is called the primary palate or the intermaxillary segment. It is a triangular area in front of the incisive fossa. This part of the upper jaw will carry the four incisors. Then, proliferation of the inner aspects of the maxillary prominences will grow in a medial direction and form what is called lateral palatine process. They fuse in each other in the midline and with the primary palate and upward with the developing nasal septum to complete the formation of the hard palate and the soft palate. In a cranial section, here we can see the developing tongue, and this is the palatine shelves. At first, the tongue is initially interposed between the secondary palatine uh, shelves, but they become uh, positioned above the tongue in order to fuse in the midline. If any alteration of this positioning takes place, this may lead to anomaly like cleft palate. In the same time, a nasal septum is formed by proliferation of the mesenchyme of the frontal nasal prominence and the maxillary prominence. It grows downward and joins the cephalic aspect of the palate. Regarding the development of the nasal cavities, we take a section in the medial and lateral nasal swellings and the nasal pet region. We're going to notice two sacs that develop by deepening of the nasal pits and the enlargement of the medial and lateral nasal swellings. They are lined by olfactory epithelium. 
that will become specialized ectodermal cells for smell sensation and they can be found in the roof of the nose. At first, these two nasal sacs were separated from the oral cavity by a membrane called the oronasal membrane, but this oronasal membrane later on will rupture, leading to communication between the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, and they are only separated by the primary palate, as we can see here. This is the nasal cavity and this is the oral cavity and they communicate with each other just behind the primary palate. With further development and formation of the secondary palate, now the posterior nasal quana or the posterior opening of the nasal cavity moves backwards and now the nasal cavity is separated from the oral cavity by the palate. In this coronal section, you can notice the front nasal prominence, the maxillary prominences. Here is the orbit or the eye, and here is the oral cavity, and this is the developing tongue. And these are the two four brains, and this is the specialized ectodermal cells that will form the olfactory epithelium. We can notice that the nasal septum is a downward growth from the frontal nasal prominence. It grows downward. And we can notice that the maxillary prominences also give us the two palatal shelves. They position uh, themselves above the tongue and meet in the midline and also fuse with the developing nasal septum. So we have here the nasal septum the palatine shelves from the lateral wall of the nasal cavity there is an extension that will form the inferior concha here is the olfactory epithelium found at the roof of the nose which is of course connected to the forepre for the anomalies of the face and palate we have what's called unilateral cleft lip which results from failure of the maxillary prominence to merge with the medial nasal prominence on one side, like this, or it could be bilateral when there is failure of the maxillary prominences uh, to merge with the medial nasal prominences on both sides, as we can see in this picture, and this is after its correction. The anomalies of the lip could be median cleft lip and this results from failure of the median nasal prominences to meet with each other and form the philtrum of the upper lip as we can see here. Another anomaly is called oblique facial cleft. It results from failure of the maxillary prominence so fused with the lateral nasal prominence, as we can see here. Anomalies for the palate, we could also have cleft palate, either cleft of the primary palate, when there is failure of the lateral palatine process to fuse with the primary palate, or we can have cleft of secondary palate. This results from failure of the lateral palatine process to fuse with each other. We could also have cleft of both primary and secondary palate. This results from failure of the lateral palatine process to fuse with each other and also to fuse with the primary palatine process. Or we could have just cleft in the soft palate and the uvula because failure of fusion of the posterior end of the lateral palatine process with each other as in this case. If there is excess fusion of the maxillary and the mandibular processes together, we end up with abnormally small oral fissure. And this anomaly is called microstomia. The opposite of it is called macrostomia, 
when there is failure of fusion of the maxillary and the mandibular processes together. So we end up with abnormal large oral fissure. It could be unilateral or bilateral. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. And if you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share.